So the Alleluia, we, now, obviously that's not English, and it's not Latin, it's Hebrew, uh, but it's, it has such deep significance to it, you don't translate it. Because you lose some of the weight of this, the, this, this, this beautiful word. And so we inherit the Alleluia directly from the synagogue. It's never been translated, but it has universal meaning now. In the East, it's used the most. I mean, they use it all the time, even in funerals. You might say, well, we use it in funerals. But of course, we never ever used it in funerals before until after Vatican II. That's because we had a theological commission that decided they wanted to do a bunch of new things. And what they did is they took a lot of stuff from Eastern churches and they brought it into our Roman liturgy. Now, even Gregory the Great went so far as to prove, I think I have it in here. It's somewhere in here. But Gregory the Great went so far as to prove that we inherited the Alleluia not from the, from the Greeks, but from Jerusalem itself. And he says it was brought to us by St. Jerome when he was doing work for uh, Pope Damascene. Pope Damascene? But in the Roman rite, it was only used once, once a year. It's used exclusively for a sign of joy and exaltation. And so it's used at Easter. Then later it was extended to other feasts, but never on fast days or for funerals. And now, I mean, it's a strange thing for me when I walk past. We, I, was, uh, I, in a, I was in a place where uh, we had both forms of the liturgy, and there was a lot of funerals there. And I, I never knew what was going on. I knew they were having a funeral, but they're all in there singing Alleluia. But liturgically, I've always understood Alleluia is just a, is, is an exaltation. It's something you're, you're, you know, bless, bless the Lord. Bless, so, and, so in the Roman rite, the Alleluia doesn't make any sense to say at a funeral. Or may the Lord be praised. I think it's, that's the, the translation. May the Lord be praised. It, I don't know, but... In the West, St. Gregory the Great tells us it was sung once a year. Sorry, he doesn't tell us that, but that it was sung once a year. There's actually a saying, something about like making your... Uh, it's, a, it's a Latinism. It's one of these phrases that you say, I can't remember what it is. It's something like, um, you know, that I may be able to hear the hymn something like that so what it means is the when the hymn is sung once that is the alleluia at easter that they'll be able to be there so that they'll have life long enough to make it to hear the one hymn at, 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 at easter time because it was only sung once and so it was a joyful thing that everybody wanted to hear but you only got the, they only sang it once once a year then it slowly got extended to different parts of the year so there's a normal alleluia and there's a greater alleluia the normal Alleluia is what we're singing like during the, it's, it seems to be strange, but during the octave, which we just finished after Easter, we had a gradual. So we finished the epistle. Then we had the gradual, which we just talked about. And at the end of the gradual, we have the Alleluia. It almost forms one continuous song or chant. But now there's no gradual. So the octave ends, that was called the normal Alleluia. And now we get to the uh, Paschal time, so the, the, until for the next 50 days we're in Paschal time, and now we have just the Alleluia, there's no gradual, just the Alleluia, and that's called the Great Alleluia. It's to celebrate this whole season of Easter. There are certain times where there is no Alleluia, like we just talked about, so they'll have a tract. A tract will sometimes even replace the gradual. The tract it, it comes to us because it, like a tract of music, a track. We talk about tracks in, like on, on a CD or something like that. That's where it gets its name. It was different than the gradual, which was a responsorial. Instead, it was one continuous, really long uh, chant that happened. And even if you open up the books today, normally in a responsorial, you have a V 
for the verse, and you have an R for the response. They're just signed in there for the, this bouncing back and forth. The gradual has a V. You get done with that, then there's the R, and so on and so forth. In the track, you have V, and then another V, and then another V, another V. It's because it's just one, it's just one chant that's going all the way down. There's no responsorial to it, meaning that it's more ancient than that formula that we had that came from, came from Antioch. You remember in Antioch where we have a psalm, and then you're saying the first verse, and then you're saying an antiphon, then the verse, then an antiphon. You just keep, uh, you just keep saying over and over, go this, um, over and over again this, uh, this antiphon, intermingled with the, the verses from the psalm. This doesn't have that. You're just singing and singing and singing. Some people had speculation that this chant was supposed to be slow and mournful because it was a penitential thing. Something put in uh, on penitential feast or when there was fasting to be done, which is true. It's used on those days, but it seems rather to be a remnant from when we had three readings. See, we talked about before there was probably three readings. We had a lesson or a prophecy, then we had the epistle, then we had the gospel. Well, there's something in between all those that tie everything together. One was a responsorial, one might have been the track. And so we have this remnant that was sung a bit differently. And though it is slow and oftentimes mournful, uh, it doesn't seem to be that that's the reason why we have it, because of because it's being so old. Nowadays, it's, it's sung during like Lent on certain days and on fast days. Fast days are like vigils before certain saints. There was always a vigil before the saints' day, like Peter and Paul. Um, the Immaculate Conception would have had one. Whenever there's an octave, they, they don't have octaves anymore, and they got rid of a lot of that stuff. But. So I just explained that. So the sequence, you've heard of the sequence. Sequences, you get them a couple times during the year, but essentially the sequence isn't all that old. I mean, it comes from the Middle Ages when they started to use, the, the people back then wrote a lot of hymns. They were, they were very gifted in writing beautiful, beautiful hymns. And in fact, that's where this comes from. It, it, they call it, um, I think they're called like farces or something like that. There were things they started to put into the liturgy just to draw the liturgy out and make it longer and longer. So in place of the Alleluia, they would write these hymns and put these hymns in there where they're just singing and singing and singing and singing. They just go on and on and on. And it got so bad that they even had some, somebody wrote one about Luther and, and they had it in there. One, somebody wrote one about beer and things like that and they had it in a mass somewhere. These were some of the abuses that started growing up around the time of Council of Trent. And so that's what Council of Trent did. It got rid of all these sequences, which unfortunately it did get rid of some old sequences that were magnificent. But it left us the five most important ones. So they came into vogue in the Middle Ages. Uh, and they, in many places, mostly like north of the Alps, they would have had a, a sequence for almost every single mass. So just making Mass really long, just singing and singing and singing. Uh, but again, these were hymns. They, they weren't, they were, somebody wrote these. They, they weren't from Psalms or from Scriptures. They're kind of foreign to, to, to our liturgy. And so that's why Pius V went to trim them back. And so he left the five best. And here they are. The uh, Victime Pascali, we just did that one this Easter. And that was written in, well, at least this, uh, uh, by, by Wipo. He was a chaplain of Conrad II, who was the emperor, the Roman emperor. And that, he died in the year 1048. We also had the Veni Sante Spiritus at Pentecost. We'll, we'll do that one. Now, some people say that that was Richard Robert the Pious. He was a king. Or Innocent III, who wrote that one. But it seems that it was written by um, Stephen Langton. I have no idea who that is, and I don't know what year it was. Uh, Lauda Sion, the Corpus Christi, we all know that one, but that was written by Thomas Aquinas, 1274. And the next two were written by Franciscans. The Stabat Mater, a Dolorosa, for the seven dolors of Our Lady. And that was by Jacopone uh, da Todi, he was a friar minor. And then the greatest of all the sequences 
And some have even gone so far to say it is the masterpiece of, of poetic uh, prose ever written, and that's the Dies Irae. That's, what's, that's the sequence that's, that's read at all Requiem Masses. I don't know if they do it in the ordinary form, uh, but if you're reading it in English, it probably doesn't sound nearly as good. Uh, in, the, in the Latin, it is magnificent. There's a local priest uh, here that says lots of Requiem Masses, a good Franciscan, and he uh, never, because you can, it's optional to say the, say the, the Dies Irae, but he always says it all the way through. It's just magnificent to hear. It just, it just rolls off the lips. But then if you, if you look at what's being said, uh, it's a deep meditation on death. And it was written by Blessed Thomas of Chilano, the first uh, biographer of St. Francis and companion of St. Francis. And so that was written in 12, well, he died in 1250, but he's blessed. Okay, so the gospel. Now we've reached the height of the first part of the Mass, the Mass of the Catechumens. Uh, it, other than the gospel now, you've got basically, I'm sorry, other than consecration, you've got the gospel is the first height, and then after that you have consecration and the, during the canon. But the, the, the height of the first part of Mass is the gospel. So St. Cyprian used to say, read the gospel which forms martyrs. It's a beautiful way to refer to it. Read the gospel which forms martyrs. At his time, they used to have even laymen. Uh, I think we're reading the gospel. They didn't have a set format on how to do that just yet. And then very quickly it became deacons uh, who would receive the blessing from the celebrant and he would read the gospel. Now remember, we talked about the subdeacon who would receive a blessing after he read because remember the the epistle, it represents the Old Testament, and Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. So here, Christ is the blessing of the gospel. He is the Gaudium, the Evangelium, the, uh, the, the, the annunciation of joy uh, that the gospel is. And so being that, he gives that blessing at the beginning, before it's read. The gospel procession has always been one of the most magnificent and triumphal parts of the Mass. It's always been very majestic and um, decoroso, uh, with great decorum. Normally, what you would have nowadays, it, it's a bit lacking. Uh, yeah, you see things get invented. When I was in California, I saw very strange things with, in the Diocese of Monterey, where Santa Cruz is, I saw a couple different churches where the celebrant would take up the gospel and walk out before the people, and then he would stand there, and everybody would stand up, and then the music was playing. It was very Disney. I mean, it really was Disney. Like, these people sang perfectly. The music was perfect. It was very Disney kind of music that you hear in a movie. So it really kind of got you going. And, but they, they were playing perfectly. I mean, I'm not, I'm not criticizing their musical talent. These people were very good. It just it wasn't, it, it seemed strange to me because it was mass, you know? But the priest came out, and he had the microphone on that came out like this, and he had the book, and he came out and he showed it to everybody, and then he made this kind of gesture like this and turned around, his vestments all kind of, that came with him, and everything went in slow motion, and then he, he went over to the ambo. Uh, no, sorry, before he, before he did the slow motion turn, he turned with the book. It was a semicircle church, so I was in the back of the semicircle church. I'd walked a long way that day, so I was pretty tired, and, I didn't, it, it, this was all kind of like a dream as I'm sitting there watching it. He turned like, he turned kind of like Mufasa in, in, in The Lion King. He turned with Simba to the, to the one side of the church and everybody just bowed. And I'm watching like half the church, was well, a third of the church, they all just bow down kind of like this and he's holding the book there. And then he brings it over to the center of the church. I was in the center of the church and I watched everybody just bow down. I was like, whoa. And then he turned again to the other side and they all did the same. And then he did the slow motion kind of matrix move and then all of his vestments. And he went over, he pronounced the gospel and afterwards he had to put it, he had to put it on, there was something out in front of the ambo so you could see the book, the whole, the whole mass, uh, which I'll get to probably isn't all that bad. But uh, I saw that again in another place where somebody tried to do that. They probably saw him do it. And then they saw, I went to another church eight miles away the next day and they had mass. 
and nobody knew to bow. <laughs> so, so he was doing all the kind of all the great stuff, but nobody knew what to do because they hadn't seen that yet. So, so the thing is, the way it used to be done, and it had been done that way for hundreds and hundreds of years, is you had the two acolytes grab their candles because the candles are very significant. Then they had the incense because the incense is very significant. And then you had the deacon. He takes the book up and he lays it on the altar while the priest is over reading it at that time. And then he kneels down, says his mundo quarter man, the words of Isaiah. Remember Isaiah when they the, 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 my, my lips are not pure, O oh Lord, and they take a coal and they you know, purify my lips, O oh Lord. So there's a whole beautiful prayer to be said. Then he asks a blessing, and then the, the priest gives the blessing over him that he'll, he'll have the, 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 the ability to pronounce these beautiful words. And then he picks up the book after kissing the hand, receiving the blessing, goes down, everybody genuflects. There's a, the two acolytes lead with their candles. The thoroughfare comes in behind them. The subdeacon goes in between the two candles. They're all now facing north. So the subdeacon, you have, you, I should have put a picture up here, but you got the two candles. You have the subdeacon. They're facing to the other side of the sanctuary. The D comes up. You got the master of ceremonies. You got the thoroughfare. Now they're going to incense the book very majestically. At first, in the old days, they didn't incense the book, meaning a long, long time ago. The incense, like we talked about a few maybe weeks ago, that incense was because you followed somebody in honor, in dignity. Somebody of honor and dignity. You carried that, in, that thurible smoking with incense because that's what you did for you know, uh, dignified people. That's what you started to do for the bishop. So now that's what we're going to do for the word of God. Then later, it got to the point where you incensed the book and then the thurifer just stood there. Afterwards, that book is taken and be kissed by the celebrant. So after the pronunciation of those profound words in the gospel, there's no song sung. There's nothing else done. The only thing the church can think to do is kiss it. That's how beautiful the action is of proclaiming the beautiful words of Christ in the gospel. The only action the church could think to do after that is to kiss the book. It's fantastic to reflect on as an expression of joy. and uh, So, that procession would mount and go across, and that's why that gradual is being sung. Oh, yeah, question. Would that have the meaning that kind of Judas kissed Jesus, and then that was right before his passion? No. It would have complete significance of the great joy of hearing the word of God, and the only way to express that joy would be to be a kiss. It's an, it's an act of love. When, when somebody loves something so much, they want to kiss it. And so that, that's what the priest is doing there. It's that exuberance of being filled. Think about it at a mass. Our Lord, who is the word, he, he is the word. As he walked with them and expounded on scriptures to them, what happened? Their hearts were on fire, right? This is what happens at the gospel. If anybody takes the gospel and sits down with it seriously and reads it and reflects on it, their heart is on fire because what you have is you have truth speaking to someone who was created for truth. And that can only do one thing except set that, that soul on fire. And so as that did, as our Lord did that to the souls walking to a mass, so he does to the priest in the holy sacrifice of the mass. And so the priest, the only, the only expression the church can think to give him is Kiss the word of God. Because that book represents him even in his person. It went so far as in the, in, the, in, the, like in the Middle Ages, they would go so far as to, and this is where it isn't so far removed, the strange stuff they were doing in the Monterey Diocese with the, the Mufasa kind of bowing stuff. But they would go so far as to take the, 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 the Holy Scriptures for the, the Evangeliarium and they would put it on a throne. And they would process it around on a throne. And they would put it in a jacket of all gold, real gold, not just like this fake gold that we would go buy at Joy and Fabric. They would put it in real gold with rubies and diamonds on it because that book represented the word of God, God himself. He was enthroned in there in, in written word. And this is the, 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 the jubilance that you find in the priest and his gesture to kiss it. Because the first thing that he says after that is... Uh, Per evangelicum dicta de leo, de leo uh, per evangelica dicta de leator nostra delicta. So through the pronunciation of the of the holy gospel, may our sins be blotted out. Because it's charity that's written there.
So the gospel is, this is from Romans, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And so you can see why they would want to go through all that pomp just to go over to read sacred scriptures. So, any questions on the first part of the Mass? In the previous slide, you had lines. Um, oh, let me tell you about that. So the AMBO, here's a couple more things I'd like to put in. Sorry, I didn't look at the slide. Uh, when the gospel was read, it was so serious. We, now, we're used to this. Complete silence. Now, remember, in the churches before, you had people packed in there. They didn't have pews. We inherited pews from Protestants. Before, you just had churches that were open, and people walked in. You still, over in Poland, you watch people just walk into the church and just fall down right in the middle of the place and start looking at Our Lady and praying. Wherever they're at, they just walk in and fall down. So you just got this open space. This is what our churches were before. The people just packed in there, and they're there participating in the Mass. They had sticks. You can imagine older people are going to be standing there for you know two hours for Mass. They got their sticks. But when it came to the Gospel, everyone uncovered their heads. It was cold. It gets cold in those churches. They uncovered their heads. They laid their sticks down, except the bishop. And we still see the bishop holds his pastoral staff during the Gospel. Only he would hold it. Later, the Knights of Malta... And the other, the other, um, the other crusading knights, the general minister, or whatever their order, he would get to hold his sword. So they had certain things that they, people started putting on there for honors and glories that people could have. Then the book was kissed by everyone until Pope Honorius. He was the pope um, after at the around the death of Saint Francis, a good friend of the Franciscan order. Pope Honorius forbid this. He didn't want the gospel being taken around to everybody. But if there was a prince there participating in mass. Or if there's another bishop there participating in Mass, you would take the book over and they kiss it. They still do that today in the extraordinary form of the Mass. Uh, so there was all this pomp for just, just for sacred scriptures and for the reading of the Gospel. Now the reading from the Ambo, reading from the Ambo, we talked about on the south side, we had an Ambo there was for the Epistle. On the other side, the north side, we had one for the reading of the Gospel. But they would face, they would, so they would, they would mount the um, ambo, and that's north. That's the way we sing it today. We sing towards the north. And they say we sing towards the north because in the north is the colder regions. That, that means it's less favored by God. This is the spiritual reasoning for it. Less favored by God. The, the pagan peoples are there that still need to receive the light of God, the flame of faith. All this is the reason why we pronounce the gospel towards the north. Well, these are spiritual reasons. The practical reason, which is always the underlying reason the Roman rite, is, well, you had it on the, the left side because, well, it's of higher dignity. So this becomes the higher dignity side of the altar. This is the lower dignity. The epistle said here, the, the gospel's of higher dignity, so you say it over here. But he would, he would face the south. Why would he face the south? Because the men were standing over in the south. Why was facing them? I don't know. But the men would be standing on because back then you split everybody up into different churches. Probably because the women were closer by, they could hear it. He would face the men so they could he, uh, so they could hear that. But he would he would mount the ambo on the north and he would face the men on the south of the church because in that time the men and the women were they would separate themselves when they came into church. <clears throat> so later. This is one of, according to Fortescue, this is one of those times where the liturgy actually took a cue from the low mass. The low mass is something that stems from the high mass, but there are a few things in the high mass that changed because of the low mass. And I'll explain. In low mass, when the, when the priest is going to say the gospel, the missile is carried to the other side of the altar. So you see, one side of the altar is for the epistle, and it's called the epistle side. One side of the altar is for the gospel, and it's called the gospel side. So when, you, when it's time to read the gospel, the server goes up, takes that missile, sticks it on the other side. Priest goes, he says his mundo cormam in the middle, where he's saying that, you know, purify my lips, O Lord. And then he goes to the gospel side, and he says, facing north. But why is he facing north? So he can convert the people in the north. No, he doesn't want to turn his back to the blessed sacrament. That was an absolute taboo before recent times. You never, ever turned your back to the Blessed Sacrament or the cross. So he wouldn't turn his back to the Blessed Sacrament, and he wanted to turn towards the people as far as he could.
because he's pronouncing the gospel so they can hear it. So he would face the north. Because of this orientation, they grew up out of the, of the uh, low mass or red mass because they're reading it, not communist, but they're reading it out loud. The deacon would start to process over when there wasn't an ambo, and they would read facing the north just like priest does at low mass. Do you see? These things happen over time. Nobody sat down in the committee and said, we want the deacon to start doing that over here now. That's not how it worked. It just, over time, in certain different places, they started to do it this way. Next thing you know, everybody does it that way over hundreds of years. And in fact, we don't even know. It's only speculation that this is the answer because nobody really knows. At least nobody I've found that seen, maybe somebody knows. Then deacon, layman, in some places it was a layman that was uh, called to, to do that. But it very quickly became, by the 400s, it was already a deacon. So much so that it became the instrument that he receives in his ordinations. He receives the gospel uh, so he can pronounce and proclaim the gospel. All right. Any other, any other questions? Not so much Huh. He uh, was the Archbishop of Canterbury. He uh, was attributed for ordination in the Diocese of Chicago. Okay. Uh, supposedly there was a conflict between Innocent III and King John over his uh, being given that position. Oh, interesting. And because of that, the Magna Carta came about. Okay, look at that. Nice. Yeah? Um, you mentioned Pope Pius the, uh, the, I think the day of the feast day, actually. That's right. I do have a question, though. Um, is there a danger of overemphasizing the gospel that it will take attention away from the liturgy of the Eucharist? No, I don't think so. I mean, well... In the, in, the, in the ordinary, the, the, the difference is this. You, you're probably asking because of the ordinary form of the Mass. In the ordinary form of the Mass, this has become a theological problem because the way the Mass works is it climbs towards, there has to be one summit. Now, the Gospel is one of the summits in the Mass, but it's not as high as the Eucharist because we're not there for the Gospel. The Gospel is something that nourishes us and, and enriches us deeply, but not more than the flesh of Christ. So the sacrifice is why we're there, because that, that constant honor and glory of God has to be, has to be done, uh, which is the sacrifice, that double consecration. So Mass in and of itself needs to climb to one point. That point is the sacrifice that happens at Mass, which is in consecration. However, they distorted that kind of in a lot of places. What you see is you got the height, this pinnacle the the gospel and then it just starts coming down from there and you see that in some of the consecration prayers they have that last about 30 seconds you start and then the next thing you know they're elevating our lord you don't even know what's happened i mean so for somebody that's not used to going to ordinary form mass much and they're always doing prayer too it's very quick it's just done like that well that shows you you, you build 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 and then you just you're out you're out of the church so that has been criticized a lot by theologians or liturgists and I've seen it in one, I've talked about it here before, but there's, there's one famous liturgist, uh, a liturgist very favorable to the ordinary form, but his books don't say anything about liturgy. His name's Eugé, uh, very critical of anything traditional. But whenever he writes, this is heretical, whenever he writes about the Eucharist, he always puts uh, the, the liturgy of the Word and the liturgy of the Eucharist he writes them differently. When he says liturgy of the word, so in Italian, verbo, he says the V and a capital V. When for the Eucharist, it's a little E. Now, th that's just offensive. I mean, the, 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 the thing is, they, they almost despise the Eucharistic sacrifice that's happening there. They don't, they don't seem to want it to happen. Some, I'm, I mean, some of these liturgists that are, would, would go so far as to say, you know, capital W versus capital or lowercase c. I mean, these are just strange things that show we might not have the right the, the right take on things. So you're right. In in the new mass, in some places, the way it's done, that it's disordered or just 
distorted, is what we can say. And Cardinal Ratzinger talks about, I believe he talks about that in this book. I'd have to look that one up. It's been a while. I think he talks about that one in uh, Spirit of the Liturgy. I'd have to check, though. I'm, I'm not, I, I don't remember off the top of my head. Any other questions? No questions. All right. We'll say a quick prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Agimus tibi gratis omnipotens Deus, pro universis beneficis tuis, qui vivis et reignas in secula seculorum. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, now, and ever shall be, in the world of God. Amen. Immaculate mediatrix of all graces, pray for us. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost.